As I mentioned during the children's sermon, we're going to be studying, continuing to study happiness and what it, the biblical perspective on happiness. So far we've looked at two different items. The first one is that it's more blessed to give than to receive. And we talked about that a few weeks ago in order for us to understand that happiness is not something that we can sort of gather in. It's not something that is, makes us successful or that successful makes us happy. It's rather that if we have a giving spirit, then in fact we are on the route, on the road to happiness. The second Sunday to last week, we talked about encouragement. And encouragement is when we inject into somebody else's life courage for them to live and to live and follow Jesus the way they would not have lived and followed if they did not have the courage supporting them. And this week we're going to be talking about judge not, pet peeves. You know, I've been, I was sitting here all the way through the beginning of this service saying, should I start with the kids and the children's sermon or should I just wait and, and start with the sermon? Because in essence, when we're talking about pet peeves, I've already begun to, to point out to us, for us, that one of the most important ways or the road to happy, happiness is when we could stop judging others. Well, one way of putting it is every once in a while, uh, Karen would point out to me very nicely that uh, I might be having a critical spirit, the way she puts it. She doesn't say you judge, she just, you're having a critical spirit. And uh, I have to admit that, uh, in fact, I frequently do. So three areas that we're studying so far. The first one, it's better to give than to receive. The second one is how do we live our lives encouraging others rather than trying to have them encourage and support us. And the third one is for today, the judgment. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you be with us today as we are challenged by your word and help us to know that you and I, as members of this congregation, need you. We need you so much in our lives. Please be with us as we worship and as we begin to study your word in your name. Amen. The text that I've chosen, actually two texts, but I'm going to break them up, are from Matthew 7. And Matthew 7 starts out with, Judge not that you, you be not judged. Let me read that again. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. One of the events in the last, I would say, 50 years, or one of the changes in the last 50 years, if you ask somebody a typical passage from Scripture, most people would point to John 3.16. You always saw the signs in football games, that the, as people would kick the ball through the uprights, somebody back there was holding up a sign that said John 3.16, God so loved the world. That passage has been replaced by people asserting that you are judging them if you express your opinion about what is right or wrong. I don't know whether you've encountered, but I frequently encountered as a pastor and as a lawyer, I frequently encountered people saying, don't judge me, you don't have a right to judge me, I can do what I want, I can believe what I want. And to a certain extent that's true. To a certain extent, it's true that we do at times come across as judgmental. In fact, one of the characteristics describing Christians today is that you and I do what? We're too judgmental. We are, and we do not have a right to judge. And again, as I mentioned, to a certain extent, it's true. But there's a principle here that we have to get to even before we talk about the passage or the principles that guide our tongues as we are judging. And that principle is what? It's better, not only better to give than to receive, but also that you and I 
must recognize that if indeed we are going to live our life as Christians, you and I have the duty and the obligation to listen to other people before we speak. You see, listening to somebody is a gift. Listening to somebody is a gift that God has given you and me when he listens to us and when we listen to one another. But there's something else here that is interesting and I think it's best put in Galatians by Paul. So let me pull that up, the sixth chapter of, of Galatians. And in that sixth chapter of Galatians, Paul writes, if I find it, Okay, do not be deceived. God is not mock, mocked for whatever one sows that will, he will also reap. That's the principle that I wanted to point out, which I have probably lost half of you. So hello out there, hello, I'm back. Um, the principle is that we reap what we sow. And that's what, Matthew, John, that's what Jesus is saying when he says, Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? What, an, what a graphic illustration. You see, all the way through scripture, again and again, in the letters of Paul, even in the Old Testament, we are told that we're going to reap what we sow. And so when you are judgmental in your life with other people, you can count on the fact that you're going to be paid in kind, and in fact, without a lot of kindness. When you are judgmental, or when we are judgmental, we actually allow ourselves to be in the position of where God is. You see, God has the right to judge us and to judge our other, other people. So whenever you and I have the tendency or the desire to judge somebody else, let's remember that you and I are bound by the reality and the principle that we, in fact, do not have the, the prerogative of playing God and we do not have the right to judge anyone. But what does that mean? Does that mean that you can't be a discerning person? No. Again and again you find in Scripture in the seventh chapter of Matthew, for example, that I mentioned before, Jesus is saying, beware of false prophets. In other words, he said, judge not. But then he goes on to say, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from, from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. What is Jesus talking about? He's saying, be aware of what will happen to you if you do not judge. If you are not discerning, if you're not there being critical in the sense of not just swallowing what the other person says whole, we have the duty and the obligation to use our minds and to use our intelligence and our, our friends and anybody else to help us to discern what the truth really is all about. And only then will we be bearing fruit. We find, for example, in Romans, a similar passage. In Romans, we are told, chapter 2, Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on one another, you condemn yourself because you judge, because you, the judge, practice every same, all the same things. In other words, the same principle, if you want out you will reap what we sow. And then he goes on to talk about the fact that you and I must nevertheless be there with a critical eye. But the difference is this. The difference is that when we are critical in reading some, or in relating to somebody else, when we are, so to speak, judging them, we are actually asking God to give us the wisdom 
to understand the person. And the way one uh, professor of mine put it, he said, you know, when you are there and you're in a relationship with somebody else and you want to judge them or you, they bother you or something annoys you, they pick their nose or something uh, in the wrong times, whatever the situation might be, they force you to go and work outside the house, whatever the situation might be, God is there and he is asking you the question, what would you do differently if you were in that person's position? What would you do differently if you were in that person's position? And that question ought to haunt us because all of us are subject to criticism from our Lord and Savior, but he doesn't criticize and love, but instead he loves us. And that's what the challenge is to judge discerningly, but not to judge so that we are taking over God's role in relating to us. It's awfully important. So let me read it to you again. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. The text is challenging us not to be hypocritical, but challenging us to actually look at the other person's life and challenging us to recognize that God ultimately will judge us. And we need to look at ourselves from God's perspective. What is God's perspective on our lives? How is he relating to us? Judge not, you're going to be judged. Isn't that an interesting example that, Paul, that Peter, John, that Jesus, uh, I'm going to run all through the New Testament books here for a second. Uh, isn't it interesting that in our lives, God has arranged our lives in such a way that he is willing to give his life for us and love us and care for us the way only he can. Otherwise, beware. To be critical and judgmental of others will have a boomerang effect in our lives. A log, isn't that an interesting analogy? A log in the eye, your own eye, and yet you criticize the splinter that is in the other person's eye. You should self, we should self-examine ourselves enough so that we can realize where we are judgmental and where we need criticism. Happiness. Next week, how to play the second fiddle. Is there anybody who plays the fiddle? I know Morgan used to play the fiddle. Anybody else who plays the fiddle? What do you think Bernstein meant, Leonard Bernstein meant, when he was asked... What's the most difficult instrument to play in the orchestra? And his answer was, second fiddle. But that's the path to happiness. Amen.